Yes. OK, very good. Um, yes, so the lecture times. As it stands, the official schedule is quite packed because I would take a 15 minute break in the mid in the middle of the lecture. There'll be 15 minutes between lecture and tutorial, 15 minutes of tutorial, but there's no place to get lunch. So what we did last year and what we would start with this year, unless for some reason it doesn't work, is that I take a shorter break in the middle of the lecture, but I end the lecture 10 minutes earlier. So I end at 10.20, uh, sorry, at 11.20 instead of 11.30. And the tutorial, instead of beginning at 11.45, it will begin 10 minutes later at 11.55. So basically, there is 35 minutes for you to actually go out and be able to pick up or eat uh, some lunch. Uh, and the tutorial also will have a shorter break in the middle and end at the usual time. So this is the adjustment for today. There's no adjustment for Thursday lecture. It will happen as, uh, as scheduled. Uh, as I said, yes, the, all of the lectures will be recorded, uh, but they will not be live streamed unlike last year, so it's, um, you can see them after, but you're not, there's not going to be a Zoom uh, thing that you can look at the lecture in real time. Um, we can have office hours on request, but what we would encourage uh, the students to do this uh, year is to put on questions on Moodle. So um, on Moodle, there's been an overflow forum that has begun, that has been made, um, and Philip has handled that, and it has a property that, first of all, the questions are anonymous, so you can always post questions anonymously. You can answer each other's questions anonymously. And uh, it, the ideal situation would be that you actually ask questions and, and even see whether you can answer other people's questions. We, the lecturers and the, the TAs, will manage the thing. So we will ensure that at, at some point in the discussion, there is a correct answer put by uh, one of us. And we will identify ourselves on the forum. So you, you know that. And the reason for this uh, being preferable to, say, office hours is because then the answer benefits all of the students rather than just talk to one of you. But of course, if you do need help with anything, you can contact us and we will arrange office hours individually. Um, lecture notes for the course. For my part of the course, quantum thermodynamics, there will be lecture notes. They are, in fact, already the old lecture notes on Moodle from a previous run of the course. And they correspond very closely to what I do. I, I adjust a few things or try to approve a few things year by year, but um, there's not much of a, of a change. I do plan to update the lecture notes uh, to make a concise thing eventually. So if when I do that, I would, I would inform you. For the other parts of the course, and as well as my second block on quantum clocks, um, there we will do our best to provide lecture notes, either handwritten or typeset. But um, we don't make any promises as of, as of now. Right. As for the topics of the course, so some people uh, have brought this up. What are the prerequisites? Is it necessary that you've done, for example, QIT uh, to have done this course? And the answer is it's not necessary, but it would have helped. So if I would say if you haven't done quantum information theory uh, in the past, then you will have to um, catch up with some things or become more familiar with some things in this course. So handling density matrices, product states, the basic notions of, of, of entropy um, and quantum channels. These are things that would be useful to have. So one of the things I would advise that you do is to look at the, um, there is a recap exercise sheet that has been put up, not the one that we've done to do today. That's exercise sheet one, but there's an exercise sheet zero on Moodle. So you should look through that and see whether all of these questions are sort of easy for you. If you've done QIT, they should just be standard. Um, yes. Uh, right, and uh, as for the lecture, please feel free to ask me. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, so what we, what we get, so there's one option already, which is that Joe Rennes, who's taken, who's in, our, in the QIT group, who's taken the QIT course a number of times, he has actually written a, a book, a textbook of this, and this is available on the ETH online library. There are probably are hard copies available as well, but there's also the online resource. So that's one thing for sure. You can just look at the lecture notes there. And uh, I mean, you, it, I guess the book has probably more than we require, for, uh, definitely more than we require for this course. But if you ever find yourself lagging, like finding something that's unclear in this course, uh, of course, ask me during the lecture. And if it is really a topic on its own, then I would point you to, let's say, go to and find the appropriate thing in those notes. Yeah. Very good. OK, so indeed, the. Um, the topics that I will do during the course are quantum thermodynamics for finite systems. That's the first uh, the block that this will run for six weeks. Um, the seventh week before Easter will either be used to do some more quantum thermodynamics or to do a block on measurement theory. But this I will inform you in due time. 
after Easter, Philip will take over. He will tell you more about his topics. When he uh, comes after the break, he will teach non-locality and uh, the quantum marginal problem. And then at the last two weeks of the course, end of May, I will conclude with a block on the information theory of quantum clocks. So those are the topics. And so now I will begin with quantum thermodynamics. OK, are there any questions about the logistics or the organization of the, of the lecture, of the tutorials? No, very good. OK, so let's begin with, with quantum thermodynamics. Um, and so to, before I begin with the quantum part, just let me talk about thermodynamics in, in general. So imagine that I want to study a physical system. So for instance, I take the gas in this, the air in this room. Right? We have a physical theory, or we have very good physical theories, with which I could, in principle, describe the entire state of the gas in this room by knowing the details of every particle in this gas. So I could say, well, if I know the position and the velocity of every particle and any other properties that I need, such as the mass, the charge, if there's interactions, then I could, in principle, predict the behavior of this from now till whenever I like. Of course, there are two problems with this. The first is the sheer complexity. Like, I, I would not actually be able, there's no computer that will actually be able to do this calculation for the gas in this room, or if I take a, a, just a single box that's microscopic in size, I can't do this because they are of order 10 to the 23, 24 particles, and this is a huge amount of data and, and calculations to do. So that's the first big problem. But there's a second, even more fundamental problem. Imagine that I did have actually all the computational power that I required. I have a, a gas in a box, and I know the positions and velocity of every one of the, of the gas, except for one of them. So there's one that has a certain uncertainty in where it is and, and how fast it's moving. So I could say, well, the predictability of this is quite high. If I have the computational power, I can start predicting based on everything that I know. The problem is that at some point, this unknown particle is going to collide with another one. And because its position and velocity are known, after the collision, that uncertainty is going to have, ha be there for both the first one as well as the one it collided with. And as this continues, that uncertainty is going to transfer to more and more particles until at the end, I've lost all of the initial precision I had in knowing the positions and velocities of each of the individual particles. So even without the problem of computational power, we have the problem of chaos. So if there is a certain amount of uncertainty in the microstate, as we call it, of the system, where I describe everything in detail, then this is eventually going to translate into a uncertainty over the whole microstate and, and sort of an unknown state of the, of the position and velocities of the particle. And so, of course, in order to still be able to um, study the gas or study the air in some form, what we need to do is we need to shift perspective. Instead of doing everything individually, we need to find some properties of, of, the, um, of the system that are, have two properties that help us. So we need to find variables for the system. And the two properties that we need are the first is they should be low in complexity. So they cannot be of the size of 10 to the 23 numbers and, and stuff like that. But the second property that they, they need is that they have to be stable with respect to internal fluctuations. So I need uh, some variable where if I change one particle's position or velocity by not an incredibly massive amount, then the, the global properties that I'm, the, or the global variables I'm interested in, they remain the same. OK. so. There are, of course, very simple examples of this that you've already seen throughout physics and the previous thermodynamics course you've done. So the simplest example of such a thing and the most useful is when you have a conserved quantity. When you have a system where no matter what the dynamics does, there is some variable that remains constant in time. And of course, the, the most typical one of this and the most important one in thermodynamics is energy. Energy is a conserved quantity unless you have a, an open system that can exchange energy with its env environment. And even if it does, then you, if you include the environment, energy is still globally conserved. Another conserved quantity, of course, can be the number of particles if you have a closed system. But these are not the only things. You can also have things that are not conserved but are still stable with respect to internal fluctuations. And in thermodynamics, the typical ones are the temperature of a system, the pressure when it comes to gases or actually any material, and the volume of a system. So if I have a confined system, especially when we're dealing with gases, I can talk about the volume of the container that it sits in. Right. And why is this useful? Well. Even though I don't know everything about the particle internally, I can already use these things to tell me a lot about how the gas will behave. So for instance, if I take my example, I have a, a gas in a, in a box. Um, and now I can say, let's say this, this wall on this side is not actually a fixed wall, but it's, it's a piston, so I've attached it. 
to a system, and this system, for example, can be attached to a weight. So now I have a, I have a thing here. So I have, a, I have a weight of mass m here that's attached in a fixed manner to this piston. And this piston now, because of the weight, there is a force uh, in, ooh, yes. This piston's, oh, I, I, I need it to be the opposite way. I apologize. I want to raise the weight. Well, actually. So, move it all the way. So, if I have a force now here, I can match it to the pressure. This has some area on the gas. I have the volume of the gas. And the thing is, once you have these variables, we can describe simple physical laws. So one of the first things that was done in, in, in classical thermodynamics is to understand that if your gas is ideal, you have very little interactions, you can actually link all of these variables. You can say PV is equal to NKT, where N is the number of particles. And K is, of course, Boltzmann's constant, um, which I will return to later when I talk about entropy. And given this, you can now describe this process of the, of the piston attached to the weight and what it will do. So for instance, you, you know that you can do work if you move um, a force through a distance, dx. And so this, in terms of the gas, will translate into dW is equal to P dV. And now, based on the relationship of P, V versus T, you can now do a calculation and get what the work done or the work put into this gas is. Now, I don't want to do this calculation. The whole point is that just with these variables, I can already understand something about work and the transfer of energy between, between this system and another system. So this is some of the, the power in um, the macroscopic variables in, in thermodynamics. Now, I want to focus now on, on three particular variables that are important and will be sort of the, the core quantities that I will talk about in this course that came about in classical thermodynamics. So the first thing is energy. So one of the big leaps in understanding um, in physics was to actually understand that there was this quantity called energy. So for instance, at first heat was thought to be some property of a material, but eventually it was understood that heat is just another form of motion and they are actually transferable. So if you put a wheel in water and, it keep, and if it's spinning at first and it stops spinning, eventually the water will have heated up in commensurate to the, the initial energy, kinetic energy of the wheel. And this understanding, of course, is associated with the first law of thermodynamics, which is just that this quantity is conserved. That's the first thing, and I, I don't want to say much more about it because it's very well done in every course. Um, the second thing, but I would actually put it as, well, it's the second thing, but it's also the zero thing, is temperature. So once people started to understand heat and understand the fact that heat was transferred between systems, you could, they realized that you could define a temperature by simply taking the, the first notion of it was you, you take some material that you understand very well. So the typical thing is water. So you know it has a state of matter where it's ice. And then if you put enough heat in it, it becomes water. But then you have to put amount of heat in it before you get to the point where it becomes steam. And you can use this to define now a temperature scale, a, a thermometer scale. And the whole notion of temperature, the reason the notion of temperature is important is because of the notion of thermal equilibrium, which is referred to as the zeroth law. So if you see that there are two objects which are in thermal equilibrium with one another, so heat does not transfer between one or the other. So, and then you take this one of the objects and you see that it's in thermal equilibrium with a third one, then you already get that the first and the third are also in thermal equilibrium. So if A is in thermal equilibrium with B, so I just use this to say thermal equilibrium, B is in thermal equilibrium with C, that means A is in thermal equilibrium with C. So temperature becomes now a universal property. And the important part about temperature, is it doesn't really care what the physics, the particular dynamics are. So you could be talking about particles in a magnetic field, you could be talking about a metal, you could be talking about a gas. But once you know its temperature, you will know whether heat will be transferred or not. So that's temperature. And the third one, which is more intricate, is entropy, which of course will 
eventually to the second law. So how did entropy come about? So at the, at the point where people understood heat and uh, that heat was a form of energy, the immediate question was, well, can you turn heat into a more useful form of energy? Because if I have heat, it's only good to basically make things warm or cook food. But if I want to power machines, so when you think about engines and, and wheels and pistons, these are all ordered forms of energy. The motion has, is very precise in a particular direction. And so, of course, knowing that heat is a form of energy, leads to the question, can I go from one to the other? And, um, and this was done in the 18th century with the construction of steam engines and other machines. But it very quickly became, um, it was very quickly realized that when heat was transferred to work, there was also something that was lost. So you couldn't just transfer heat to work for free. Work to heat, yes, because with the example of a wheel in water, but heat to work, no. Um, and so the, the usual way of writing this as a diagram would be, imagine that we have some, some thing that's at a hot temperature, some body at a hot temperature, some body at a cold temperature, and then we have some machine here that gives us work. So I would just write it as, as W. Then you would see that if you looked at Q hot and you looked at Q cold, the first thing you would see is that W was definitely less than Q hot, so you really needed the heat to be thrown to the cold one. And then people began to study this in an abstract manner and realized that actually you could quantify the amount of loss and the best efficiency. So it's named after Kano, who's one of the first people to understand this. And you can find that W over Q hot is less or equal to one minus T cold over T hot. So this is what is known as the Kano efficiency of a heat engine. Okay, so once they understood this, the immediate thing they realized is that now you can define a new quantity based on heat flow. And this new quantity would have the property that in any thermal process, it has to increase. So now what I can do is I could say, let me define in a, in, during the process, let me define a change in heat from a bath divided by the temperature of the bath, so Qj or Tj. Let me define it as the change in entropy. So this is really the thermodynamic definition of entropy. And then the statement is that in any process, the total ds, so the sum over j, dsj, must always be greater than zero. So in this case here, if I write this here, it would be q hot over t hot. And now, because I've drawn an arrow for q hot, I'll put this as a minus, because this is the change in entropy of this bath, and q hot is now a negative quantity, plus q cold by t cold, where t is the temperature of the cold bath, must always be greater than zero. And if I add this, and the statement that energy preservation, the first law, Q hot minus Q cold is equal to W because these three energies must match up to each other because no energy must be created or destroyed. If I take these two equations, I can get this equation. They are formally equivalent. And so this was the definition of thermodynamic entropy in the first place, essentially an indirect thing. You, you realize that there's, you can define a quantity that must always increase, therefore, and you call it entropy. But the interesting thing is that Later, Boltzmann came along with a much more concrete definition of entropy that was really information theoretic. So he said, actually, imagine that I take a system, and now I can talk about the microstates. So microstates, going back to the, the example of the gas, would be the actual configuration of all of the positions and velocities of, of the particle. And then there's the question of a, a macrostate. So a microstate would be every um, x, j, v, j. And the macrostate would be, oh, I don't know all of these things, but I can just tell you, for example, the global variables. So for example, I tell you p, v, n, t, for example. And now you can say, well, imagine that I know the mi macrostate of a system, so I know the global variables. Well, that means there are a number of microstates that are consistent with this. So there's a, there's a big number, and, and let me call that. So for every macrostate, macro there is, let's say, m 
microstates. And so what Boltzmann said is, well, I can define now a new quantity entropy that I say is some constant of proportionality times log of the number of microstates. So for every microstate, the amount of entropy that's corresponding to that microstate is log of the number of microstates. This is assuming you do not know the microstates. So if you did know the microstate, then, then of course this is redundant. But if you only know the, uh, sorry, yeah, if you only know the macrostate and you don't know the microstates, then you have to consider, well, it could be any one of these. And then the entropy, which is now sort of the lack of information you have, is given by k log of m. The important thing really to understand of, about the behavior in entropy is, is not really m itself, but how entropy changes. So for instance, if I have, imagine that I have a, a particle, so I have a gas, and there's a division halfway through the box, and there's nothing here, so this is empty. And then I lift this division, and, sorry, and now the particle is anywhere, right? So calculating the actual entropy in this case, I would have to go like, well, let me look at all of the number of microstates, and the same thing here. But calculating the difference in entropy is very simple because everything here, when I look at the possibility for the position, here it had half of the possibilities as it has here. So everything has increased by two, basically. Every, every, uh, all of the possibilities have gotten multiplied by two because the position now has twice the number of places it can be in. So I can see that basically S prime, so rather M prime is equal to two times M, which gives me delta S is just going to be K log of two because when I take S1 minus S2, I'm going to get the ratio of M prime and M. And, so, and this is also quite neat because log two is like saying, well, it's, it's proportional to one bit of information. Previously, I knew that every, gas, every particle of the gas was in the left of the box. Now, for every particle of the gas, I've lost this one bit of information. It's, it's become, yeah, uh, every one of them now can be in left or right. OK. Right. So this, uh, this connection between the thermodynamic entropy and the information te and uh, theoretic entropy is going to be an important part of the course. And one of the really neat examples that demonstrated this connection in a very concrete way, which actually turned out to be a, a sort of paradox that went on for quite a while before people really nailed down what the explanation was, was that of Maxwell's demon, which I'm only going to describe briefly now because it will come up in the course in more detail. And the demon setup was very simple. You had a box. You had a division in the middle with a door that could be opened and closed. And the idea was, imagine that there's a little demon sitting here. And they have the ability to open or close the box. And you first start with essentially a gas that is, as, is at equilibrium throughout the box. And now what the demon does is very simple. They just go, well, every time I see a particle approach from the right, so they're looking at the particles on the right that approach this door. If I see that it's a hot one, I'm going to let it through. If it's a cold one, I leave it. And the same way, if I see a particle approach from the left, if it's a cold one, I'm going to let it through. If it's a hot one, I'm going to leave it. So basically, the hot particles go, I don't know which one I said, but let's assume that the hot particles are always sent through on to the left, and the cold ones are always sent through on the right. What you're going to have at the end of this is you're going to have here a hot gas and here a cold gas. But this is a problem because now what I've done is I've, I've generated a temperature gradient and I can use this to do things. So here I cannot do anything with it because everything is at equilibrium. Here because it's hot and cold, I can run a thermal machine, machine between them because I have two thermal bars. Yes? Ah, sorry. I mean a faster one. <laughs> Yes, yes. No, I, I, that, that's actually, I shouldn't say hot or cold particles. Those particles on their own are not hot or cold. I mean faster ones and slower ones, yes. So essentially, the kinetic energy in the left side increases, whereas the kinetic energy on the right side decreases because I let the faster ones on the left and the, the slower ones on the right. Thank you for the question, and sorry for the, yeah, semantics. Um, yes, so as a result of having faster particles on the left, then that becomes a hotter one. Uh, proportionally. So we assume that the number of particles let in on one side or the other are, are the same, so that you still have the same n on both sides. And then using the ideal gas law, you, you see left becomes hotter. So this becomes, so this is now a problem. And you say, well, 
I seem to have violated the second law. Because one of, one of the statements of the second law is that I cannot transfer heat into work um, without some other increase in entropy somewhere else. And I seem to have done that here. And the solution to this is really the connection between the thermodynamic and information theoretic uh, quantities that describe entropy, which is to say, well, in order for this demon to actually make the measurement of going, oh, I see a particle, and then I see whether it's fast or slow, which is a decrease in, in uncertainty, because first it, it knows a particle is coming, but we don't know what the speed is. But then it looks at it, it makes a measurement, and recognizes that it's fast or slow, and based on that makes a decision whether to open the door or not. In doing this, the demon is actually going to increase its entropy somewhere else, because it requires the computational machinery, a memory to write the result of the, uh, the measurement it makes, and then that memory has to be used for the next one, the next particle that comes along. So it has to now reset this memory. And that is a thermodynamic process. So the end resolution of this is to say, actually, this demon is also a thermodynamic quantity. And processing of information does not come for free thermodynamically. And so you see now a connection between just the thermodynamic notion of entropy of heat and temperature and the information-based one where you go, how much do I know about the system? Or what's the uncertainty that I have about the system? Go on. Yes, exactly. So when you take into account the process that the demon goes through to store the information, to use it, and then to reset its memory for the next round, you see that they increase in entropy. So the decrease in entropy here is matched by the increase in entropy of the demon. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So all of that is just about classical thermodynamics. Um, and so now I want to end with just a brief thing of, well, what do we do with quantum mechanical uh, systems? So Classical thermodynamics has all of these quantities. You have the laws of thermodynamics. They're well understood. But now when you come to the quantum scale, you can ask an entirely new set of questions. So one of the questions is just of, so let's say with quantum thermal, so the first question is one of size, which is how small and what does it look like? So for instance, I can go, well, I, have a, I can understand the engine in my car. It's this big gas with a piston, et cetera, et cetera. But now imagine I'm working with quantum systems. I'm working with qubits in a, in a quantum computer, for example. Is there any notion of thermal machines? on the scale of, a, of quantum mechanical systems? Or do I have to throw it out the window because it only applies to systems that are very large? And so this is sort of the first question. And there is a, one, of the things that, one of the things that we will talk about the course and one of the focal points uh, of the course and a, a goal that we reach is of talking about autonomous quantum thermal machines. So I've actually drawn one schematically there where each of these are two-level systems. So they are really qubits, each one connected to a thermal bath, which is at a particular temperature. And what you can do by tuning the energies of these and starting an interaction between them is that you can actually draw heat from a cold bath and, of course, from a hot bath and put it into a room temperature bath. So even though the cold one is the coldest temperature, you can actually end up drawing heat from that, which is really the working of a fridge. So this is really the same as an absorption refrigerator. It's just that the working material, instead of being a gas or something more complicated, are just three qubits. So this is really the smallest possible refrigerator you could understand in the world. It's just three qubits working. And so this is one of the things that we will get to into the course. And so that's one of the questions you can ask about quantum thermodynamics. Um, a second question is, again, from so info processing. And then there, is, there are two versions of this. There's the classical. And then there is the quantum. And what do I mean by this? So as I just described, Maxwell's demons, you can, you can, understand, you can understand the resolution of the paradox that the demon is you know, information processing, and they have a thermodynamic cost. So now I can just describe this on the classical scale by going, OK, I have a bit of information I need to erase. This is also something that we will get to the course. What is the um, cost of erasing a quantum cube, uh, oh, sorry, a quantum, but erasing a bit? So for instance, imagine that I have a two-level system. And that's 
that I describe as my bit, I draw them at the same level because I don't need there to be an energy between them. Um, and I want this bit to be put entirely in one of the levels and not into the other. So it, there shouldn't be any uncertainty because I need it for a computation. How will I do this? Well, one of the things that we'll talk about the course is a protocol where I interact this bit sequentially with thermal bits. So I take a, a bar that's connected to each of these uh, other qubits. And each of them has this energy spacing that is tuned very well from starting from about zero to some maximum level. And I interact this one with each of these in turn in such a way that at the end, even though it might have started in a mixed state or maybe even the fully mixed state, at the end it's very close to being only in one of them. So this is the erasure of a bit, and it's an important part of information processing. So this is something that we will talk about, but there's also the question now of quantum correlations and how they affect it, because what I could have, for instance, is I can have this qubit, but I can also have another qubit that's on the side, and I can say, well, actually, I know that these two qubits, they start out in the state, um, I think it's psi plus, no, phi plus. Phi plus AB, which is the maximally entangled state, so it's uh, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1 square root of 2. Now, the thing about starting in this state is that actually the state is a pure state. There's almost, there's no lack of information in it. But if I ignore one of them, so if I ignore A, if I call this A and this B, and I describe the state of only B, then B is going to be a mixed state. It's going to actually be the maximally mixed state. 0, 0, plus 1, 1 upon 2. This comes from just doing the partial trace over A. So if I only describe B, it has a lot of lack of information, and I need to do erasure. But if I describe A and B together, then actually I have no lack of information, and maybe I can do something clever that will erase B without needing any thermodynamic cost. So quantum correlations and quantum memory is going to affect the, um, the erasure cost and the information processing cost that I have in thermodynamics, and more than just classical correlations. Yeah? Um, so what's the difference between like the red and blue arrows? Ah, so the red and blue arrows, what, what I use them to, so just to, they are actually a representation of the following Hamiltonian. So imagine that I've, I label these by 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, the, the states. This will be the Hamiltonian, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, plus, of course, the Hermitian conjugate. And so this is to, to say that when this qubit loses energy, both the other two gain energy and vice versa. When this qubit gains energy, the other two lose energy. And that's how the energy transfer happens. Yes. Very good. So that's one thing. Um, and the third thing is just the laws of thermal... For quantum. So just to ask the question, well, I have the zero at the first, the second law of thermodynamics. If I try to do this now in quantum mechanics instead of in classical mechanics, will I get the same thing? Will I get something that's stronger, something that's weaker, or, or just more in general? And these are, these are the other questions you could ask. Um, very good. OK. Are there any questions so far? Very good. So with that, now let me get technical. And yes. OK, so because we deal in thermodynamics with energy, um, the most important thing when we study quantum states is the energy basis. So let's do a little bit of a recap. So we know the description of quantum mechanics is you have a Hilbert space HS, and then you have a state psi that belongs to HS, so psi of S. So I have some system. It belongs to some Hilbert space. Um, this is how I can describe pure states. I, can, I, I know I can also write psi S in any orth orthonormal basis as sum over I, say, um, i phi i, where this phi i is an orthonormal basis, so phi i, phi j, is delta i j. And this is how I describe pure states. Um, what you should also know is that you can do mixed states as well. So in case I have an ensemble of states, um, so I say it's in, it's in one of the states, psi, I'm going to 
check out the, the system index. It's not required now. So it's one of the states psi i with probability, let's say, pi. Okay, so I, I know my system is in one of these states i with probability pi. Then I describe this by a density operator, which would be the sum over i, pi, psi i, psi i. Right. In, in linear algebra, we um, represent these by column vectors, and rho, the density matrices, are matrices. Um, right, and in this case as well, of course, I can do the same thing. I can write each of these psi i just like this in a basis, so I can write this as sum over i, and uh, let me call this now a i j phi i phi j. So I can always find what these a i j are in, in any basis. So this is really the writing it as a mixture of states, and this is writing it in terms of, an, of a particular basis. But as I said, thermodynamics deals most often with energy. So for us, the energy basis is the most important. So once I have my Hamiltonian of the system, I know I can write this as well. It's its own basis. It's just the energy basis. is sum over n, e n, e n, e n. So e n are the energy eigenstates and the values associated with them. Um, I can already stay, say, state at this point that one of the things that we'll do a lot since we work with small systems is I will represent the Hamiltonian by diagrams like that. So really, I can write it as so E0, E1, E2, so on and so forth. So this is a useful way of writing uh, the Hamilton of a system, because then I can also write down interactions on these diagrams, and it becomes intuitively clear as to what's interacting with what. OK, so with respect to this basis, rho is going to have a particular form. So I'm going to write rho as sum over mn of rho mn em en. So if I ever refer to the density matrix without saying what basis it is in, you can assume for this course, for the thermodynamics course, that it is in the energy basis, because that's really everywhere uh, that we want to study the changes. The particular reason why the Hamiltonian and the energy basis is the easiest to understand the density matrix is because of Schrodinger's equation. So if I write the dynamics of a system in time, then I know that I can write for pure states, I can write it as i uh, h bar d psi by dt is h psi. And for density matrices, if I do the same, we get that d rho by dt is equal to minus i h comma rho. Um, and the consequence of this equation is just that if I have one of the energy eigenstates, so En, then in time, this just becomes e to the minus i e n t e n. Um, I'm also going to start going with h bar is equal to 1, because we will really not need this proportionality constant in the course. Um, yes. If you ever do construct a thermal machine and then want to think about the actual energy scales and stuff, then of course, you need to put back h bar. Um, right. And so what this means is now that I can take this density matrix, I can evolve it in time, and it has a very simple form, sum over mn, rho mn, e to the minus i, em minus en times t, em, en. OK? Now, I'm going to use some terminology here. So we will call rho n, n. I will actually usually refer to them as p, n. And these will be called populations. Why do I call them populations? Well, imagine that I had a density matrix rho, and I actually made a measurement in the energy basis. And I say, what is the probability that I find that the state is actually in the state n? Then it's actually going to be pnn. Because if I take this is equal to trace of rho times the projector on the en space. So it's en, en. It's really the probability of being in the n state. Okay. Then 
we're going to have P M N, where M not equal to N, and E M not equal to E N. These are going to be called coherences. Now, what I've done here is I've differentiated between two types of um, elements uh, that I would call off diagonal elements. Um, one where M, where even though M and N are different, EM is equal to EN. So this is basically the case where you have a Hamiltonian where there are two energy levels that actually have the same energy. So they are two different uh, eigenstates, but it's, it's a degeneracy. Um, and the case where for the, there are two different eigenstates and they have different energy. And the reason that I've differentiated between them is precisely because of this term. So you see here that the only terms that actually change in time are the ones that have a difference in energy levels. So one thing that definitely doesn't change in time is the populations, because they are, they are for the same n. So it's rho nn, and this is just 0 in the phase, so it's just 1. And also, if you had different m and n, but em was equal to en, so degenerate states, then as well there, you would not have a phase. So the phases would remain constant. The only things that actually gain a phase in time are the ones that are different energy levels, different energy eigenvalues. So I'm going to call them coherences. Okay. And do okay. Let's go to the next board. Okay. So then we perhaps it's 10:29. So I think I will stop here, or I'll pause here rather, and give you a five-minute break to use the restroom if you require. We'll continue at 10:35. I think at that time Philip will be here to introduce himself as well. All right, so um, welcome also from my side. My name is Philip Kamalander. I'm going to teach this course together with Ralph, who has already done the introduction. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be here um, at 9.45 today, so that's why I'm saying a few words now. Um, yeah, so um, Philip Kamalander, I said that, my name. Um, I'm a lecturer at ETH. I'm uh, leading, uh, at the same time, the executive office of the Quantum Center at ETH. And, um, I look forward to giving this course, um, at least part of this course, this semester. Uh, I think it's a very exciting course. Also, lots of freedom for both the lecturers and the students because it's sort of very open on, on what is going to be covered. Um, um, so, Ralph has already told you a bit about the Moodle Overflow Forum, right? The anonymous one. Okay, so I don't need to, I don't need to do this again. Um, as Ralph has probably also told you, we will start with a, a big block on thermodynamics until Easter, more or less. And after Easter, I will take over um, and uh, I will essentially discuss two main topics with you. One of them is going to be uh, generalized Bell inequalities and non-locality. And the other one is going to be the quantum marginal problem. Um, the, so the second one is going to be the bigger part. Regarding the first one, so non-locality and, and um, Bell inequalities, um, I'm still about to check how much has actually been done in the QIT course with Joe last semester, but maybe some of you have been there and you could already give me some input, so not much. Okay, so if I, okay, but you have seen a Bell inequality? CHSH, okay. Well, then I think it's worth like trying to bring this CHSH inequality into a bigger picture of generalized versions of this inequality see how we can distinguish local, non-local, quantum, non-quantum correlations. And then certainly the idea is to move on to um, be able to um, certify non-quantumness using semi-definite programming, which is a technique that is worth a lot also outside of this non-locality discussion. So that's the main uh, focus of the first part, the, the non-locality part. The second part, quantum marginal problem, is going to be about, <coughs> um, so, so given you have, a, um, say, a many-body system, uh, but you only have access to local states of some subsystems of it. So, so you have you have n qubits, but you only know the, the, the density matrices of the three qubits here, the three qubits here, and maybe the three qubits there, and some others. The question is, given these local states, what could the, the global state possibly be? That's a very uh, very natural question to ask, and it's actually a difficult one. And this is what we will investigate in the so-called quantum marginal problem. So that's going to be the second bigger part of, of the essentially five weeks that I'm covering. Right. Um, that is what I wanted to say to give you an overview of, of what, what, is, what is the plan from my side. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be here now for today. I will stop by every once in a while in the coming weeks before Easter as well. And then, of course, I will see you for a bit longer after Easter.
Thanks. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them now or maybe afterwards. Thanks, Philip. Good. Okay. Um, very good. Right. So um, the last thing I was saying was yes. So we write the uh, density matrix of the system in the energy eigenbasis, and we differentiate between the populations and the coherences. So what I'm also going to do now is to write it in terms of um, an actual matrix. So if I write rho as an actual matrix, I can I have of course the p the row zero zero, rows one one, and these of course are the populations. And then I have, let's say, this is row 88. Eight. I have these terms like row 81, row 18. And if, if E1 is not equal to E8, then these are coherences. So row 18 and row 81 are coherences. Yeah. So in this geometric picture as well, we see the diagonal elements remain the same. The off-diagonal elements under the Hamiltonian, they remain the same in magnitude because that equation does not change except by a phase whose modulus is one. Okay. So now there's another thing that we can do. We can call states incoherent. Basically, if all of the coherences equal to zero. So essentially, a state is incoherent if for every non-degenerate eigenstates of energy, EM and EN, you have no density matrix element there, so it's just zero. And an incoherent state has the property that it's not going to change in time because not, um, all of the things that could change in time are zero. So there is one, one way of writing it is rho MNs equal to zero for all EM not equal to EN. But the other way, uh, algebraic way of writing it, is that rho commutes with the Hamiltonian of the system. So if rho commutes to the Hamiltonian of the system, it also means that uh, rho mn is going to be zero because what this means is that rho is block diagonal. This is something that you should remember from basic linear algebra. If a and b commute, then they are block diagonal with respect to each other. So with respect to the diagonal basis of H, you have that rho is also diagonal, at least in everything that is uh, non-degenerate. Within degenerate spaces, you can have some, some freedom, but within non-degenerate spaces, you have no freedom. So one example of this is here's an example. Let me take H to be of a three-level system, so a Q-trit, and I'm going to say that it's, uh, let's say, E0, 0, 0, plus E1, 1, 1, plus E1, 2, 2. So this is also the same as saying H is E0, E1, E1. In that case, if rho is incoherent, that means it must be of the form, and I write it as a, uh, a three-level system. So I see what the blocks of H are. These are the two blocks of H. And a block is defined with respect to all of the eigenvalues that are the same. So there's a block for E0 and there's a block for E1. And so the density matrix, if it commutes with H, has to be in co uh, has to be block diagonal with respect to the same thing. So these have to be zero. These have to be zero. But here it's completely general. Well, general as in it still has to be a valid density matrix. Otherwise, it's general. OK. Is there any question? Yeah. Well, they, so when you have the same energy, so one of the things is when you have the same energy, the fact that this is an off-diagonal term is not actually very um, uh, important because when you have the same energy, you can define a new basis. So if I have this uh, Hamiltonian, we also know that when you have the same eigenvalue, I can define a new basis from superposing these, and it will also have the same eigenvalue. So for example, I can define plus, which is equal to one 
plus 2 upon square root of 2 and minus, which is equal to 1, minus 2 upon square root of 2. And h will now look exactly the same. It's going to look like, let me write it uh, with a new pen. So it is also going to be the same. It's be e1 plus 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 e2 minus minus. Oh, E1, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so when you have a, a state that is incoherent, even though it has off diagonal terms, you could always actually diagonalize it. So you could diagonalize rho so that it is diagonal with respect to some basis of H. Now, there is usually a preferred basis for the Hamiltonian, when, especially when you have uh, multiple systems. So for example, if you had the, in those three qubit machines, you had these eigenstates 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0. And we will see in the case of the autonomous machine that you choose them to be the same energy. So they are sort of the preferred basis, and we will still write the density matrix off diagonal with respect to them. But indeed, you could still diagonalize it with respect to H. OK. The reason I differentiate between these two is now actually a practical reason, which is the following. So imagine that I have some density matrix of a system. And at some time, t is equal to 0. It's prepared like this. Okay. And then I come by later, or I, I prepare it, and then I leave it. And somebody comes by later and wants to either make a measurement on it or make some unitary operation or some transformation on it. And the person wants to know what the state is at that time. So of course, if I have t is equal to 0 and the person knows that they come along at exactly t is equal to this particular time t, then they will be able to predict exactly what the state is. But what happens if there is some uncertainty in t? So imagine that. So from t to t prime, t prime is uncertain. So it, it lies within, so t prime, let's say, lies within some interval. Um, let's call it t naught minus delta and t naught plus delta. Okay. So the person comes along, but they have some uncertainty in the time that they actually look at the system or do anything to the system. And they still now want to predict what's going to happen when they do the transformation or the measurement. So they need now to understand what the density matrix is going to look like at if they have some uncertainty in that time. So what do we do? Well, because all of the measurements and other transformations are linear, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if there's an uncertainty in a time, we have to take the average state that could be seen depending on each of these times that you could come along. So I take the simple case now that you're completely uncertain here. So it's like equally probable that you can be in any place in this interval. Then I take rho to be rho average, which is going to be integral from t naught minus delta to t naught plus delta of this, let's call it rho t, et. And of course, I divide by, so it should be normalized, divide by 2 delta, which is the size of this interval. Okay. What is it going to be? I'm going to really take this one here. Now, I'm going to get three different terms. So I'm going to get sum over n, rho n n. These don't have anything. So these will just integrate to be exactly the same, because they are constants. So if I, if, if I integrate a constant over something of 2 delta divided by 2 delta, I'm just going to get exactly the same constant again. The same thing is going to happen for the degenerate state. So sum over mn, where em is equal to en, um, rho mn, em en. But the third term is the interesting one. So plus sum over mn. Uh, rho n n, and now my integral is going to be on the inside of e to the minus i e m minus e n t d t e m e n. OK? And this is of interest to us. Now, what is this quantity? This is a phase. So basically, if I plot this over time, this is just going to be something that traverses the unit circle. So this is 1 i minus 1 minus i. And so this is something that's going to go, well, it will be in this direction if em is great, is less than en, it will be the opposite direction with the other case. But this is now e to the i or minus i em minus en of t. So imagine that, so I have now different regimes. So imagine that at t naught minus delta, it was here. And at t naught plus delta, it's here, OK, the phase. Then if I do this average, I'm going to get something that's in between somewhere here, let's say. Okay, 
So I'm going to get that as a phase. So you already see the phase is now going to be slightly less than one, and it's an average. But I have a much worse situation where imagine that t naught minus delta is here, but t naught plus delta is goes a number of times and then comes back here. So it's the, the delta is long enough for the phase to rotate a number of times before it returns. If I keep rotating and I average basically over the entire circle, I'm going to get zero, because the average of the entire circle is zero. So this is something that I can give you to do. Just put in that the t naught doesn't matter really. You can just say from zero to some delta and, and normalize it, and see that as the integral increases in time, you get something that's smaller and smaller and smaller until when you go to infinity, it just becomes zero because you're averaging over a phase. So basically, if delta is large enough, the coherences are zero. The coherences are sort of averaged out. And so the physical principle now that we reach is that if I am doing thermodynamics or if I'm doing anything quantum mechanically on a state that's evolving, in order to keep track of phases that change in time, I need a good reference. I need a clock, essentially, a reference frame for time. Yes? Yes. Yes, so you're not going to get exactly zero for a number of rotations plus a certain amount. But the more rotations you add, the, the, um, essentially the closer and closer you're going to get to zero. Um, yes, it is a measure zero set for, over which it's, it's zero, but it's for any other, for any parameter, you get a decrease. So you get a decrease in the phase from one toward, the modulus of the phase decreases from one towards zero. And, and then basically what this means is that every time you interact with this after, with some uncertainty, you, your phase will decrease more and more towards zero until you lose. Yeah, Philip? When you see that you can back up to delta, yes. uh, so if delta is the size of the Riemann algorithm, yeah. the longer of delta is the longer Yes, indeed. So I was going to get to, if, imagine that you, you had the same t minus delta and t plus delta was, was this point, but after one rotation and this, you would immediately get an even worse answer because now you've averaged over a longer thing, even though you're two phases at the same point. Yeah. Yes, and indeed, it's not, it's not an instantaneous thing that if you have some uncertainty, you go to zero, but it's, it's a thing of like, you're going to keep losing information and you're going to spiral in your information until you, you don't know the phase. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this actually splits thermodynamics into really two sets. So you can have incoherent thermodynamics where you say, I do want to do thermodynamics. I want to build these machines and stuff, but I don't actually have a clock. So there's no clock. And so I cannot really keep track of the phases in, in a system, so I'm going to deal with incoherent states. Yes? Can I ask two questions? Actually? Yeah. The first question is, so there should be like a divide to delta in the integral, right? I, yes, sorry, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I put the integral, but I didn't, oh, I didn't put any of the things. But yeah, 2 delta, t naught minus delta. Yes. And then like No, 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 no. It's just n. Yeah. So this is. So I, I've done. The, uh, so this is the. Sorry. Ah, yes. You're here. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, em equal to m, but m not equal to n. Yes. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. So, if so, for example, well, so the only weird thing that can happen is if the person does not know when they look at the system, but it just happens to be that the point at which they look at the system is some perfect integer multiple of the period or perfect integer multiple plus a particular phase. But practically, this is never going to happen. So, for instance, take the example: the period is one second, um, and and you you come along and and you you come along at some time, and I tell you, I made it, I made the state sometime between five and six six seconds ago. So you see, there's no, yeah. So it requires it actually requires time information that is obscured, but actually is still precise in a certain way. But for
then you then you could then you would still have phase information indeed so if i told you you're going to come along at exactly n multiples plus pi let's say then your your phase would be perfectly determined and then you yeah but that that exactly corresponds to having a clock because you need to know that you came along exactly at that time yeah good um yes yeah, so as i said this really divides thermodynamics into two parts you have the incoherent thermo and then you have coherent thermo where you actually have a reference frame thermo so you have a clock or reference frame or time okay um, in fact even though we deal with small quantum systems and qubits a lot of this course in the, at least in the first part we will deal with stuff that actually works without coherences so you do not require coherences so the quantum nature is really in the fact that you have finite states you have qubits and you have interactions and hamiltonians but the coherences and phases will not be required for the um, for the first few things that we talk about at the end of the thermo part and then definitely in the quantum clocks part there will be a lot of talk about coherences and how it affects uh, thermodynamics okay uh, any questions all right, so then let me proceed with the second fundamental thing that we will need, which is okay. So so far we've only talked about states. So the next thing to talk about is the operations. Now, in quantum mechanics, you learn of two levels of describing an operation. So the level that we are most interested in is a unitary operation. So this would be described by any operator such that u dagger u is equal to u u dagger. This is always true for finite systems, is equal to identity. Um, but of course, you could also talk about CPTP maps, where you describe rho goes to a sum a k dagger, rho, I'm oh, sorry. AK, rho AK dagger, where the set AK dagger and K, sum over K is equal to identity. Um, did you do the, did the people who do the QIT do Steinspring dilation, the concept of that? Okay, so the basic concept is that if you have a closed system, then you only do unitary operations, but if I do uh, a unitary operation on some composite system, but I'm only, I'm only caring about the map on one of them, so if I do something like um, a unitary operation on two systems, A, B, U dagger, but then I don't care about what happens to B, I really am interested in, in A. And so, oh, actually, no, let me do it this way. So it's, it's rho A tends at some fixed state of B, and this gives me rho A prime. Then this effect, this is really described as a CPTP A, TP map on A. Okay. So it's the more general version of a unitary operation, but the important thing is it can always also be written as a unitary operation just on a larger system that involves something that you threw away at the end. Um, in thermodynamics, we are going to really stick to unitary operations, and the reason is one of resources. So when we have a second system and we throw it away, then clearly there can be the transfer of, for example, energy and entropy between these systems. And in thermodynamics, accounting for these is very important. So that's why we typically deal with unitary operations. We, even if we have a CPTP map, we consider the larger system on which we did the unitary operation because we want to keep track of energy, entropy, all of the, the quantities that we care about. Um, unitary operations have uh, a number of nice properties that we will use. So the first thing is that you can always write any unitary operation in some basis, so there exists some basis of pi i uh, and another basis, let's, uh, let's call them u and v, so u, i, and v, j, such that you can write this as a change of basis, oh, sorry, v, i, u, i, v, i, sum of i. So there's always a basis uh, change that you can describe a unitary as. So while every orthogonal state, uh, orthonormal state goes to another orthonormal state. So that's one property of unitaries. Um, the second property is that the um, entropy 
is conserved. Now I haven't, so that by entropy here I mean trace or minus trace of rho log rho, which if you know the basis in which rho is diagonal, then that's the Shannon entropy in that case. So you can also write it as minus uh, sum of pi, well, I'm not going to write p here because I used it for populations, qi log of qi, sum over i, where these are the eigenvalues of rho. So this is particularly useful because it, as I said, one of the quantities we're interested in is in entropy, and um, the unitary operation conserves the entropy. By the way, there will be much more talk about why this is a good entropy, how to link it to thermodynamic entropy and so forth, but for now it's just a definition of, of that. Okay, so these are two useful properties of entropy of the unitary operation. Uh, ah, yes, should continue on this board. Okay, um, now there is a special class of unitaries in thermodynamics which are energy preserving unitaries. Now, depending on the literature, it, they will be called energy preserving or energy conserving, it doesn't matter, it's the same. Um, and these are ones that commute with the Hamiltonian. So if I have a unitary operation that commutes with the Hamiltonian system, I call it the energy preserving unitary. The name comes from exactly the obvious reason, it conserves the energy of a system. And what I mean is that if U commutes with H, one thing that can be checked is that all of the populations that I talked about earlier, the populations, um, so let's put it this way, that the populations in, right, the total population in um, degenerate blocks, is conserved. So, so for example, if I take this particular example here that I wrote a three level system with a Hamiltonian that is degenerate between the second and third level. If I have a unitary operation that commutes with the Hamiltonian and I act with it on rho, what it's going to do is it's going to leave this population unchanged because it's a single element. In this block, it can move population between those two, um, but it can, it can the, the sum of these two is always going to remain the same. So another way of looking at this is, is actually the following. If U and H commute, then U again is, is block diagonal. Block diagonal with respect to H. So U is going to be of the form, basically what I can do is, once I have the blocks of H, so imagine that these are the different blocks of the Hamiltonian. What I get is zero, and these are, these are now not elements, but matrices in themselves in all of the off-diagonal ones. But in the diagonal, in each block itself, I can have a general unitary operation, so some arbitrary rotation or change of basis. Okay. Right, so, un so the unitaries leave the populations the same, and in particular, and this is actually a weaker statement, they also leave the average energy the same. So I could, so the average energy, which perhaps I could have defined earlier, but I will define it now, so actually, let's use simpler notation, E average, is defined the usual way, it's the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, which is trace of H times rho, which once I write it in the, um, in the basis of energy, I can also write this as sum over N, Pn, remember this is just rho Nn, times Pn. Okay, so in the basis of energy, it's a very simple quantity. And the property of energy preserving unities, of course, is that it leaves E average the same because the only places where it changes Pn are between degenerate states. So this, the, even though it transfers population, it keeps the energy the same whenever it transfers. So E average is also conserved by U that is energy preserving. Okay, yes?
This one here. Ah, this one. There exists. Yeah, it's a, ah, uh, it, that is a, yeah, okay, yeah, I do think that, it, that is a symbol for there exists, right? Oh, it's like this? Oh. Okay, I have stopped looking at it then. I didn't, when I type said, I just typed the actual command, but I have forgotten what it actually looks like. Okay, sorry, yeah, that's there exists. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, Yes. Oh, very confused. Um, okay, very good. Any questions about energy preserving issues? Yes. Just to make sure we said that that's a good question. Just to yeah. make sure the total population is the fraction a divisible block is defined as the sum of the population. Yes. In that block or yes. in that block? Only in that block. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So yes. So population degenerate blocks. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe I, I write it down explicitly. So this would be um, the sum where uh, over n, where en is equal to some, let, let's say it's some particular value, so omega, of pn. Or, or let's say, okay, let me put it as rho nn. So you choose a particular value of omega that exists among the eigenvalues, and then for all the n such that, such that en is equal to omega, you sum the population, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have 15 minutes to do qubits and temperatures. Uh, let's use a new board. Okay, so one of the things that we'll, we will do in this course, and we will lead up to it, I think in the fourth, third or fourth lecture, we will do it in detail, is really justify the notion of a thermal state. So a state that we understand to be in equilibrium at a particular temperature, in equilibrium with a with a external a big bath that is already in thermal equilibrium. So there are many ways to understand it, and we will justify it based on different notions of passivity, of equilibration, um, and so on and so forth. But for now, to start the course, I'm just going to define um, what a thermal state is in quantum mechanics using a Gibbs state, which I think you've sort of already seen in um, classical thermodynamics. So. The definition of a Gibbs state is where if I have um, a temperature, uh, and, and another thing that I'm going to do from now on in the course is, usually I'm going to deal with inverse temperature rather than temperature. So we're going to take beta, which is equal to one upon kT. Okay, so this, this is a quantity I will use. And it'll become very clear why, because T is actually a bit weird and discontinuous, whereas beta is not. But anyhow, if I have a Gibbs state, it's defined as rho is e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian, and then I normalize. So to normalize this, I just divide by its trace, e to the minus beta times Hamiltonian. And this is, um, this is usually called the partition function z. So when I write z, it just refers to the trace of, of that. Okay, um, so yeah, so the original definition is h divided by kt. Um, but yeah, I'm re replacing H with beta, so you have, you have that, okay? Right. So that's the thermal state. Um, and now what I'm going to do is, so ima imagine now that I have the simplest case, so I have a qubit. So I'm going to take uh, H is equal to E times one, one. Okay, so this, the, this, the qubit is defined by the two states that are right as zero and one, and I take a Hamiltonian that is just E11. One, one. one of the things that I didn't state explicitly so far is that when you have the Hamiltonian, um, because everything, all of the dynamics is based on the difference in energies, so as you saw in the dynamics, it's always EM minus EN, you have the freedom to shift the total Hamiltonian however you like, and so the typical thing to do, just to make life simpler, is to shift the lowest uh, energy, which you call the ground state, to make it equal to zero. So then if you have a qubit, you just have one energy. It's the energy difference between zero and one. It's just the energy of one, okay? So if I have this Hamiltonian and I have a beta, what do I get? I'm going to get that rho is going to be one upon one plus e to the minus beta e, zero, zero, plus e to the minus beta e upon one plus e to the minus beta e, one, one. 
So the nice thing is when I write things in the energy basis, all of these are actually operators, but in the energy basis, then it becomes, they're all diagonals, so I can just write it in each of the terms individually. Okay, um, so this is one way of writing it. The, the defining thing to see that it's, it's a thermal state, there are two things. So one of the things is that it is diagonal. And so definitely incoherent and also diagonal. Um, so there indeed there are no coherences or any phases that are changing in time. And the second thing that defines it is you can look at the, the population P1. This is now, oops, sorry. This is P1 and this is P0. And you can look at the ratio P1 divided by P0 is equal to e to the minus beta e. And this is what is, I will refer to repeatedly as the Gibbs ratio. So that's a defining property of, of a thermal state. Now, I did this for a qubit, but even if you have a completely general system, so I, let's say I now do the general thing with eigenstates EM, I'm always going to have that they are diagonal. It's still the case. And I'm always going to have that the population in the mth state divided by the population in the n state is e to the minus beta em minus en. OK? Uh, one of the things that you should uh, note is that this beta is not, um, is not sensitive to the labeling, because I can also write this as pn, um, pn by pm, oh, sorry, is still e to the minus beta en minus em. So I don't have to be careful that I took the higher energy level state and I labeled it as m and the lower energy and I labeled it as n. No matter how I define it, these two, I mean, these two equations are exactly the same because I flipped this one here and I flipped the exponential. So beta is defined. I take two energies. I don't have to order them. I just choose one first, choose one second, and I will get from the ratio, I will get a temperature. Is this clear? OK, that's good. OK, so this is now sort of a real temperature, actually. Yeah? No, no, I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that way. I just meant that the the, um, the definition of the temperature uh, defined via two levels is you, you don't have to worry about the ordering in the levels when you write the equation. It's just a it's a physical property that doesn't depend on. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I would call a real temperature. So the next thing I want to do is I want to do, talk about virtual qubits and virtual temperatures. OK. And so what do I mean? So of course here, yeah, so here I have a qubit. It's in a thermal state. And so of course, p1 by p0 is going to give me a, a temperature relation. But the thing is, what I can do now is imagine I have a general state. It's not in a thermal state. What I could do is I could just take two energy levels, and I can see, matching it to this ratio, what I would get for the temperature. So what do I mean? So imagine that I have a state rho that is, oh, it's getting worse, that is incoherent. The rho is incoherent. So I'm already I've already assumed that it has um, no off diagonal terms. And I pick two energies. So I pick energy EM and energy EN, or rather two eigenstates of energies EM and EN. And I pick that such that EM is not equal to EN. OK? So just to say, what this will mean is that if I look at the density matrix rho, and this is the EM state, and this is the E n state, in the same way here and here, then I'm, I'm guaranteed that I will call this rho m m, rho n n. I'm guaranteed that the rest is all zeros. Okay, because I've said it's incoherent, so there are no there's no off-diagonal phase. 
between the infrared ones. Sorry, um, I, say, I should say two things. So these two are zero, and I will also define it as incoherent and uh, actually, let me just say diagonal. Sorry. So this is something that's n that depends on the context of when you're trying to use it. So it's not really important. But for simplicity, I'm going to start with let them all be diagonal. So there is no off diagonal terms anywhere. Okay. At some point, I will explain when it matters or when it doesn't matter. That's incoherent or diagonal. Okay. So at this point now, this state does not have to be a Gibbs state. So it does not have to be defined via e to the minus beta h. But what I can do is I can say, well, let me take pm, or rho mm, or let me just write a p now, and pn. And it's going to exist, there's going to be some beta that exists that this will be true. And I know this because, well, pm by pn is just some number between 0 and infinity. And I can get any number between 0 and infinity if I have any, any difference here multiplied by beta. So beta is allowed to be negative, positive, anything. So I can always define, so this is now a definition for beta mn, which I call the virtual temperature. That says, well, if I just looked at these two energy levels within my system and ignored everything else and just said, well, let me match it to a thermal qubit, what would the temperature be? And that's what I call the virtual temperature. So in turn, the virtual qubit is really just this pair of levels that I've taken. Yes? Yes, beta can be negative. So I, I, yeah. Yes, so here's the thing for quantum mechanical systems and especially finite systems, that is different from classical system. So in, um, and in fact, I'm going, to, I'm going to get, well, let me explain the, the different regimes of beta, and then, and then we see how this uh, works. So, so imagine now, just to understand it, that EM is greater than EN. So I'm going to understand EM is the high energy level, EN is the low energy level. Then if beta is, let's take the simplest value, beta is equal to 0. If beta is equal to 0, then this is 1. That means pm is equal to pn. If beta is, e is greater than 0, that's a positive temperature, then pm is less than pn. So lower population in higher energy. And if beta is less than 0, then you have pn greater than pm which is the opposite of this, and it's also called, I would call it inversion. Now, the reason that you don't see this in classical mechanics is because in classical mechanics, you usually have unbounded Hamiltonians. So you have an energy space where the energies really go, well, all the way to infinity. So if I have a negative temperature then, that would mean that if I know the population of one of the lower energy states, then there must be a higher one and a higher one and higher. This is now not a physical state because it would tell me that the population must just increase to infinity as I go to the infinite energy, which doesn't give me any sort of normalization. With positive temperature, it's fine, because now I have some population in the ground state and a decreasing one until I get to infinity and there's no population at all, so I can have some normalized state. So whenever I have an unbounded Hamiltonian, I can never have, so for this really thermal state, if H is unbounded, beta has to be positive, otherwise there's no physical system. But in quantum mechanics, this is, is, uh, is, def is allowed. Um, yeah? Exactly. So now if I, if I look at this on the, on the temperature scale, um, it really, so this here, so this is now uh, the temperature scale. This here is beta going to plus infinity, where T goes to zero from the positive side. And, and, and that's why the temperature scale is, is slightly unnatural for quantum systems, because this here, T going to zero on the negative side, is actually beta going to minus infinity which is to get an inversion where all of your population is the opposite. So that's why beta is the, is the better one because now when you think about beta, plus infinity is really absolute zero, what we realize absolute zero, very cold, and minus infinity is everything is in the highest energy eigenstate. So lowest and highest. Okay, now come. Okay, so 
that's the notion of a virtual qubit. And I think we can leave it here because to continue would take more than two minutes. Okay, very good. So yes, with that I conclude the first lecture. Are there any any questions of any technical content or yes? So oh sorry, just uh, this is the same as that. Um, what I meant was so these two equations are the same, yes. Yeah. So it means that whether I I um, so for example, if I in in this case here. P1 by P0. So I could, I could do it this way. I could say P1 by P0 is e to the beta 0, 1, e1 minus e0. But I could just say, imagine that I took them the opposite way and I defined a different one. P0 by P1 is equal to e to the beta 1, 0, e0 minus e1. Okay. Well, they are equal. Yeah, so yeah. Like yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I meant that this implies that. So I thought I wrote the, the thing. Yeah. So this means that when you're calculating the virtual temperature, or you're writing it down, you don't have to know which was a high energy state. Yeah. So in fact, I would, I would conclude to actually give you a reason, why do we do things with virtual temperatures? The whole point of, of quantum thermodynamics is that um, we have access to some temperatures. So let's say we have a, some bath at a hot temperature and some bath at a cold temperature. Um, and so then we have thermal states at these temperatures. But the point um, is that when we look at and this is what we'll do in the next lecture. When we take the thermal state at one temperature and we take a thermal state at another temperature and we look at the joint state, then of course this is not a thermal state because beta is different for one and the other. What we will find, and that's the whole point, is that when we look at the joint state, we will find transitions, so virtual qubits, where I just pick two energy levels in the joint state that have virtual temperatures that are different. And in particular, those virtual temperatures need not be only in between the ones I use to generate it. So even though I have a hot temperature and a cold temperature, I will get virtual temperatures that are not only in between, but that are hotter than the hot one, and some that are colder than the cold one. And this is the whole way we construct thermal machines. We use two thermal baths, but we generate an engine, which is really to generate something even hotter, or a fridge, which is to generate temperature colder. And, and the way we do it is by looking at virtual temperatures in the joint state of both of the, the hot and the cold part of the machine. And so that's what I will get in, in next, well, tomorrow's lecture, the composition. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>